Thank you for joining the Colorado SBDC for their Cyber Summit in 2021. So this Cyber 101, we're gonna keep it basic. We're gonna really start at the foundations. We're gonna talk about nothing too technical, but everything that's important for you in your business. So a quick agenda and a little bit about me as you're looking at this agenda. We're gonna talk IT Cyber, which is my background. I held my doctorate degree is in management, but I concentrated in what's called cyber psychology, focusing on people and technology interactions. And I feel that is strongest where our deficits lie. And just to let you know, cyber security is exactly the same thing as information security. We just came up with the term cyber because we wanted to be cool kids at the table. That's just, just keeping it real, just letting you all know in some insider secrets, don't tell anyone. Next. We're gonna talk governance, which is probably one of the most boring things you can possibly think of. However, those are the non-negotiables. Things you have to do in order to do business. And then we're gonna talk the operations of the business. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into risk, talk cultures and attitude, and I give you a little bit of homework to do, a little bit to take with you. So this is worth something for you. So IT Cyber. IT is the computers. Cyber is your environment in which the humans are interacting with those computers. So if you think about like an IT professional, an IT professional is the person that is gonna come fix your computer. However, that concept of the environment, including the technology and your business, that is essentially what we're calling cyber. When we talk information security, we are simply talking that same exact thing. So when you talk information security, you're talking business environment and the technology environment. That being a written copy, a hard copy, a piece of paper, or an email, or something electronic. So if you're, if you're running a medical practice, we're talking PHI and EPHI. All of that is part of that information security environment. What our job is, and what your job is, is to protect all of that information. It is total holistic, we're just identifying and we're breaking things down into small chunks. Why you wanna protect this information is if it's sensitive, if it's proprietary, if it's confidential, if it's PII, or personally identifiable information, something like your social security number is what we think most of, your address and a telephone number, some of those things, if you combine them together, you can really get access to someone. And if that information is public or if it's private, if it's public information, you may not have to worry about it. If it's private information, then you definitely got to worry about it. Cyber, exact same thing. If you're thinking information security, think cyber security. It is all the same thing. Just know we wanted to come up with something so everyone would talk about us and listen to things like this. So we called it cyber, kind of hit off. That is information security, the exact same thing. So when people focus on IT security and focus on the IT environment, they may be missing that business environment. Once you include those two together, we are talking cyber. So ask yourself some of this question. Who has access? to that data and information. Why you wanna ask who is because is that person trusted or is that person simply an intern in which you didn't really run a thorough background check on? Do you have NDAs or non-disclosure agreements? If you have non-disclosure agreements, gotta make sure who has those, who you have those with, and how are those going to be upheld? Because those are contractual agreements between you and the service provider or the service provider and you. You have to make sure you understand all of this, and that is what we're calling cyber. Now that we got all these basics out the way, let's dive in. When we're talking cyber, we're talking IT. Rule number one, don't wait, update. If you start thinking about clicking, let me, I'll do it next week, I'll update next week, I'll update the week after. That is a detriment to your organization. Simply, we call this patching 
application programs, your operating system. You know that annoying thing that says, hey, do you want to restart now at the most inconvenient time possible? I understand. You don't have to restart then, but you want to restart later. If you can, set to auto-update overnight. If that's possible for you, set it to auto-update overnight so you don't have to worry about it. The reason why you need to update is because once old operating systems are out there, they're easily breakable. Like, there's no knowns. Between the cyber community, there's a dark side to the cyber community, and those people we just call simply hackers, black hat hackers. And they know all the information that we know, and they're just simply going to use it against you. If you can, get a firewall, something hardware, something software, something that you can just simply buy off the shelves. A few, it's like Norton, McAfee, Kapersky, if you would like. Combine all of those fire, software firewalls and your internet protection or your internet protection suite and your antivirus. That is what you would need at the very, bare minimum. My recommendations, something more than just Windows Defender. Something more than just what comes out of the packaging. You want to add in a layer of security. Typically, if you think about the door on your front door of your home, there's two locks to it. There's the deadbolt lock, and then there's the small lock that's on the handle, most likely. The reason why there's two locks is because you want to practice what's something called defense in depth. Multiple layers of defense, multiple layers of protection for you. If you think about your business, if you have a place of business, a brick and mortar, most likely you have a lock to the door. And then on top of that, you have, you have the alarm system if someone breaks in. It's the same exact thing. You want multiple layers of defense. Next, regular users versus your, privi your privileged users. Regular users are just normal people, that just functional employees. Privileged users may be someone with more access, someone to your level of access within your organization. Good rule, never work in admin. Always have an admin account. Do not work every day as your admin account. You just want to use that just to provide your updates. Everything else can be done without those privileges. Practice, your, give yourself the least amount of privileges on the day-to-day -day as you possibly can, and then when you need to, you can log into that, to that big bad admin account. Next, asset, asset inventory. Your asset inventory, just ask yourself, what are you protecting? What, it, what are you actually doing? What are you protecting? If you don't know what you're protecting, then you're really shooting in the dark. You're just throwing protections out there willy-nilly, hoping something good happens. You want to have a good plan of attack. That plan of attack starts with an asset inventory. What are you protecting and what is critical to have? If all else breaks down, what do you need to have in order to operate your business? Write those things out. Not everything has to be the most important thing in the world. You can run, you can run a, a place of business, you can run a fast food place without every single register. But which register is the most important? That's the one you want to make sure you take care of. Write those down or map them out if you can. Protect those at all costs, because if you lose those critical assets, you cannot do business. Everything else matters, but it just matters less. And then, where's the goods? Where is the PI? Where's the EPHI? Where is, where is the finance information at? Know where that is, wrap that up, Protect that at all costs. If you can, throw everything you possibly can at it because those are the things you are protecting. Everything else, bells and whistles. Another analogy, think about your car. Your car can function without the radio. Your car can function without every single seat belt working if it's just you in the vehicle. However, there's certain things you need to take care of in order to keep your car running. Granted, is it nice to have the radio? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I, I listen to my tunes all, all day. Michael Jackson fan all day. I need it. But can I get to work without it? Definitely. So I need to make sure I protect the engine, make sure that I'm changing the oil, 
because those are critical to the system that I am working in, the vehicle for this example. So next, you can then think about your computer. Let's think about protection and let's start at the basics. That basic starts with a password. Obviously, we know, we may know this. If not, let's go ahead, uh, let's go ahead and let's run down it anyway. Complexity, you want to make sure you have letters, numbers, uppercase, lowercase, special characters, emojis, whatever you can throw in there. You want to make sure that it's complex. Don't write it down, don't share it. Change it periodically. I would say once a quarter at least, because just know if someone has that password, it doesn't matter how complicated that it is, because it's known. It's a known password. All they have to do is type it in. Don't use the same password for all accounts. I will ask you to ask yourself, how many times are you reuse, reusing the same password? Don't lie to me. Just be real with yourself where a lot of people are using the same password for different, for different uh, websites. And just think, if that website gets hacked, that password is then known. And now that password is known, it doesn't matter how complex it is, because I am just typing in what I am looking at to log in as you. Have a, some type of policy in place. A policy can include passwords has to be at least 10 characters with this level of complexity to have uppercase, lowercase, special characters. Have something. If not, the password's going to be password. Or the password's going to be password one. Or the password's going to be password two because that's twice as secure. We need at least something, some type of policy in place. And then if you can, you can use a password vault like LastPass or KeyPass. And it will generate complex passwords for you and store them for you so you ain't got to remember them. You don't got to remember them. So everything I just said about passwords holds true, holds strong. I firmly believe in it. Now, let's move on from passwords. I will ask you, let's stop thinking about passwords and let's start using passphrases. You can use a passphrase whenever, wherever this says password, you can use a passphrase and passphrases are better and easier to remember than a password. So the example password is like the one that's on the slide right now that is way too complex for me to even try to read out. I'm going to stumble all over myself. But a passphrase is what's on the slide as well. Passphrases are easier to remember and are secure. Just the level of the amount of characters that there are, it is way better. However, we're going to interject, we're going to interject some, some special characters, uh, some emojis or whatever we want to put in there, so a dollar sign, an at sign. That makes that passphrase significantly stronger than that password. And you can remember it. So if you're going to ask your employees, ask yourself, all right, we're going to come up with passphrases instead of using passwords. We're going to make this transition. Reason why, the more characters, the better. The more characters, the more better it is. Second, we can remember phrases even with unusual letters better than we can remember the alphabet soup that gets thrown out and you're getting told to remember, not write down, don't tell nobody. And the second you come up with it, you look at it, you click next, it's gone. So, but a passphrase, we can come up with some. So here's, here's a couple of examples. Bite my thumb at making this pass. It might mean nothing to you, but you might just kind of giggle at it. But if you want to make it very complex, you can add in the exclamation point. You can add in the capital T and at instead of the word at, at, and then another exclamation point and a few dollar signs. That password is absolutely insanity. But for you, if that's something you came up with, it's easier for you to, because it actually means something. It's not just random characters thrown out there. Next one, my pet lizard hates yodeling. I don't know, I don't, I don't have a pet lizard, and don't ask me to yodel. It's going to be absolutely miserable. But if my pet lizard hates yodeling comes into that, 
that means something to you and there is no way in anybody's mind that you're just going to randomly guess that or a computer's going to come up with that password outside of a few eons. It's going to take years. And let me tell you, if it takes some years and they really, really, really want to get, get at you and they're going to wait 100 years to do it, so be it at that point. Who cares? And I encourage you to make it something funny, make it something meaningful, or you can even use a song lyric. Like I said, I'm a Michael Jackson fan. If I use Don't Stop Till, Don't Stop Till I Get Enough, and I just add in a few special characters, that is a very, very, very formidable password. But it's actually a passphrase. It's a phrase. It's not just a word. It's a phrase. It's, it's something that's memorable. You, something your husband, your wife, your significant other, uh, a joke that you all have, and you just write that out, it's going to end up being like 30 characters long, which is absolutely awesome. Throw in some special characters, and trust me, you got it. You'll remember that. You'll actually remember that. Start, stop using passwords and start telling yourself and your employees, hey, we're going to come up with a passphrase. I'm going to use my favorite song. I'm going to use my favorite vacation place, my vacation place memory. Or, hey, this Dr. Huffman guy makes no sense. Throw all of that out there and then call it a password. But it's actually a passphrase. This is where we need to go. Next, with your protection, Start thinking multi-factor authentication. As cool as a passphrase is, as cool as a password is, multi-factor authentication is like the high school quarterback cool. It is, it is like Will Smith, Fresh Prince of Bel Air cool. You need to enable multi-factor authentication whenever possible because it adds an extra layer. It's the second lock to your door. So I have the password. I have the passphrase. I just found it laying around somewhere. However, if it sends a note to my phone, in order for me to get access after you type in the password or the passphrase, that is success. That is the level of security you need. Whenever you possibly can enable multi-factor authentication, you better do it. That, that's, if I can give you any order, that's it. Go, go to work, tell people, Eric said, you got to do it because you should probably do it immediately. Actually, pause the video, do it now, then come back, finish it. Previously, passwords that have been used before and found before are just as bad. There's a website. That website is on the slide. Is that have I been pwned, P W N E D, slash passwords. Type in your password there. And if it comes up and it says green, fantastic, you're good. If it comes up and it says red, you need to change it. You should do this. Every employee that you have that has access to any kind of digital system should do this. And you should do it quarterly to make sure that the password that you're using hasn't been found in a data breach before. Because what hackers do, actually it's, it's not quite as cool as one would think, once a website gets hacked, that information gets sold and it sells all the usernames and all the passwords. And then they can just start guessing well-used passwords. So make sure you check your password before you wreck your password. That's horrible. I don't know. I'm trying. Nevertheless, mobile devices, same thing. Same rules. Make sure you update them. Make sure you're patching them. Make sure you have multi-factor authentication because you absolutely need it. And then make sure you have some type of protection suite on it, some type of antivirus, some type of internet protection, more than just what's out of the box that's given to you from Apple or Samsung or Huawei, whatever device that you're using, something else on top of that. Have separate accounts if possible. And if you have a BYOD policy, bring your own device. Make sure you separate the personal users versus the business users. Because people go home, 
They get, it's their phone. It's their, they brought their own device. They can do whatever they want with it. And then they're bringing it back to your secured network. Make sure you separate those out. You, you have to. And then everything else. Let's throw everything else out there. Identify your internet of things. Is it, do you have a Nest thermostat? Because I, I got one. Those things, the level of convenience is absolutely amazing. If you don't have one, I recommend one. That is not an endorsement. That is a recommendation. But if you have a refrigerator that connects to the, that connects to the internet, you need to make sure you note that. Alarm systems, various phones, televisions, all of these should be identified. And if you can, put them on a separate network and patch them regularly. If not, man, it's, it's very, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because there are case studies where a casino uh, about 10 years ago was hacked through a thermostat on a fish tank. It's just think all of these things are connected together if they're not separated out. So if they can connect to your refrigerator and it's connected to your administrative computer, there's a way there. And you need to identify all those devices and just know I somehow need to protect all of these devices because they, it is just not your refrigerator. It's a computer disguised as a refrigerator. Now your non-negotiables. I don't know every business that is watching. I don't know your business personally. But you need to understand the laws that you have to comply with. If it's HIPAA, if it's FERPA, if it's FINRA, if it's FISMA. A few of those, just naming those out there. Just know your plan, if your plan includes not, and not having your governance in place, it is a bad plan. I don't care if it's something I came up with. It is a bad plan. You have to understand the rules in which you have to abide by. And then you have to do those. And then every business activity has to include and in line with that overarching need. Nevertheless, look at, your, look at the standards. Is it PCI DSS? Um, is it GAP? Is it NIST? Is it ISO? Align with all of those, then you start bolting on security suites. Do not, do not go the opposite way. Because if you're trying to bend the rules to reach compliance, there's no such thing as halfway compliant. You're either compliant or you're not. Make sure you are compliant first. If you have policies, make sure those policies are written out in the language in which your governance requires. If they call it red and you think it's blue, make sure you call it red. Like, that's, that's exactly what you would need to do and base your strategy internally and externally based off of that. Because there's a few things that can stop your business in track, one of them being a cyber attack, another one being losing compliance. If, imagine being a healthcare provider and you're not HIPAA compliant. Like, what, what are you doing at that point? You selling kidneys or something? You have to make sure you're HIPAA compliant. If you lose it, make sure you, Make sure you do everything to get it back immediately. All right, let's talk operations. Operations, very simple. What are your employees trying to accomplish on the daily? What's the, what does the day, what does every day look like? What does a random Tuesday look like? And start thinking about how they're gonna, how they're gonna operate. So there are chiropractors that, there's a chiropractor that reached the credit card breach based off of poor daily practices. I've seen the same thing at a dentist. I've seen the same thing at, very front, uh, at various front desks where PII has been exposed on the front desk. And then someone takes it, runs with it, and then they start looking at policies and how does the daily operation look like? What does every day look like? And start aligning the daily operations with your cyber plan. Phishing is one of your biggest concerns. So you can think, you set up this amazing plan. You follow everything to the T. You set up this amazing plan, and someone decides to download an attachment that contains some malware. That is contributing to your own attack. The idea of phishing is to get you to contribute to your own attack. Let's use an analogy of a house. You can have your doors locked, alarm system set. However, 
if you unlock the door and then clear the alarm and allow that person to walk in, it doesn't matter what you have. Phishing is that exact same scenario where someone is clicking and allowing something in, and allowing someone in. Phishing training has to start with the person and start thinking, why is this person clicking? And just stop thinking about, yo, the Nigerian prince. Don't give money to the Nigerian prince. No, they're, they're way better than that these days. Have some type of awareness program. This awareness program should be conducted at least annual. Have some tabletop exercise. There's a game, it's a card game, and it's called Backdoors and Breaches. If you, if you can get a hold of it, cool. That's, that's a fun one to do. Or start with various scenarios. Find a teacher. I love K-12 education. Find a teacher. Have them help you create, a, create an exercise. They're absolutely phenomenal at doing so. They can come up with games and various rules. Start trying to make security fun. Vocalize, socialize, be about what's important. If, you, if someone reports something, reward good behavior. Because you are in control. Miss no people are in control. We are all in control. We are the difference between data breach and no data breach. And you have to reward that. If people feel like they are out of control and they're just at the, at the hands of the cyber gods and say, hey, I hope there's no data breach today, they're going to feel out of control, and so behavior can become erratic. Conduct incident response remediation if plausible. Let me stop. If you're at this point, you're like, all right, I was good. Now we're talking incident response, like you got to throw on a cyber cape and jump in. No. Find who to contact. You can contact SBDC. You can contact your, your MSP or some type of service provider and see who you need to contact to see what, to what is next. If you have cyber insurance, contact your cyber insurance, and they will help you. Think about how do you conduct incident response, like, hey, something bad happened. I don't know what to do. Cyber insurance companies have something called breach coaches. They are coaches. They're someone to help walk you through an incident. If you can walk through an incident and they will help you out the entire way, you're going to feel way better. Do not try to just throw on the cyber cape, put up the little bat cyber sign in the sky, and hope someone's going to come. Like, it's no, just know who to reach out to. Don't just try it on your own because data is important at that moment in time. At the first click, at the first time you see something, jump into action, watch the pros help, and then you're going to become one of those pros as well. You're going to be leading that incidents response effort. Risk. Risk is most important to your business. Risk is most important to your security posture. There's a few things you're going to do. Mitigate, try to get rid of the risk, accept it. There's a few risks that you have to accept. It just is what it is. For example, Amazon.com. One thing that they have to accept is the fact that they're publicly available. Everyone can get to Amazon.com. Is it a risk? Yeah. They just attempt to lower that risk to an acceptable stage. You can avoid it, or you can transfer it. Transferring it, you can think about cyber insurance. You're just going to you're just going to have cyber insurance, and you're just going to transfer some of that risk over to the insurance company. When you come up with your, when you're thinking about your risk, I'm going to ask you to write them. I'm going to ask you to write all of them down. And here's a simple way to weight your risk. Use a one through five scale. One, not risk. Five. It's pretty much a promise. And we're going to base this off of probability and consequence. So, for example, the probability of a zombie apocalypse. We can say it's like a 1. But the consequence is like a 5. And what you're going to do, multiply those numbers together. We got 1 and 5. We got 5, which means I'm probably not worrying. I'm probably not worrying about it. A risk is a risk regardless, but you want to base it off of how likely is it to happen, and if it happens, how bad is it? So the example that's on the slide, a risk is that your website may get hacked. If you did or you did not hire a professional or use a professional service, the probability can be high. We can say it's like a four because you just went to a 
you just got a website, you threw up a template, and you're just kind of winging it. You're not very confident in it. However, if, you're, if that website only advertises your service and it does not collect any data at all, and it's just like, hey, go to acme.inc, and that's all it says on it, the severity of that is probably like a two. You might take a reputation hit or something like that, but it's probably like a two, because no, no PI is leaking. Nothing really detrimental is going on. So we have a four and we have a two. You multiply those together, you get an eight. The max is a 25. As you're going through weighing out your risk, you should never get a 25, because that is not a risk, that is a promise. That is, it's gonna happen, and it's gonna hurt very badly when it does happen. You should not get a 25. Uh, but everything that's like a 12 or a 15 and up, start mitigating those. This is an awesome way. It is an awesome way to prioritize what you actually need to get done, because every business is different. Store all these risks. I encourage you to type them out. Excel is fantastic for it. Just name the risk, describe the risk, what's the probability, what's the consequence. Review them, list them all out. Try to get as many as you can. If you can get 50, try to get 100. If you can get 10, try to get 20. List them all out, weigh them out, and try to prioritize them. Because honestly, the truth is, security and being secure doesn't exist. It is absolutely fake. There's only varying levels of insecurity. What level of insecurity are you willing to accept? If you're willing to accept a variant level of insecurity, you're fine. But to say we are 100% risk free, there is no risk, we are 100% secure, you are lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody else. Everybody is at risk if you're doing business and you're conducting business online and you're taking online payments or you're taking digital payments or you have a brick and mortar store and someone's walking into your place of business, there is risk regardless to say you're 100% secure. It's not true, it's not true. It's just how insecure are you? And if you're at an acceptable level of insecurity or you're just winging it, just make sure you understand that as you're going through, what are the risks? Which ones are you gonna mitigate? Which ones are you going to accept? Because there's some risks you have to accept then go from there. Don't get to the point where you have your risk register and say, hey, I need to mitigate all these because they all need to go away. That's a farce. That is not reality. Because everybody is insecure to some degree. Just is it acceptable? Is it at an acceptable level or not? That's up to you to decide. Next, business continuity. So something hits the fan. We all know what's hitting the fan. Something's hitting the fan. How are you going to keep your business running? Start thinking about that. Because your plan cannot include, you know what, we're, we're just gonna, we're gonna shut it down for like a year. That's a bad plan. We've, we're coming through, hopefully at some point in time we're seeing the end of COVID. I wish you all were here. But we've seen the bad things that happen when we just, when you can't operate and there's no business continuity. There was no business continuity plan and you're just winging it. You're struggling to make it through. You need to make sure you have some type of business continuity plan. If there's a data breach, if there's a natural disaster and at this point, probably would have laughed a couple years ago, but if there's a pandemic, how are you going to still operate? It's about keeping the business going. If there's a cyber attack, your plan should not be, we're shutting everything down and we're going to do nothing. That's a very difficult plan because you still need to operate. You still need to serve your customers. You still need to serve the community. We need you. We need you to serve the community. How are you going to, how are you going to continue to operate? Ask yourself some of these questions. What information or data does my business produce that is considered critical? What is important? And start thinking about, I really need this. This is just nice to have. This is the engine to my car. This is just the radio, and this is the AC. There's times it's like 100 degrees this, this summer. It's crazy. Kind of need AC, but at some point in time, it's just a nice to have. Then where is the data processed, transmitted, or is it stored? Where, where is that at? Identify that. How is it protected? 
Who has access to it? And then start training everybody on it. Train everybody on it, walk through it, because if something hits the fan, if there's a data breach, this plan is going to be how you're going to continue to operate as you deal with and as you come through your data breach or your, your cyber incident or the natural disaster or the pandemic. Start thinking about that because we need you to continue to operate. So as we're talking about all this, and you're going to go to work, you're going to be like, all right, got a plan, got my risk register, identified all this, did my asset inventory, I'm sitting solid right now. You're going to go to work. There's, there's a thought process that security comes at a price of convenience. And it's hard to bolt that on. It's hard to say, you know what, now I'm going to need you to come up with a passphrase, and it's going to be like 30 characters long. It's supposed to be easier for you to remember. That change is going to cause people to, re to, to resist. It's going to cause people to push back. It's up to you to help cultivate a positive culture of security. And that must be supported from you to the top. If you're at the top, I'm glad you're listening because we need you to support everybody preaching security that's within your organization because it's absolutely necessary. You need to enforce that. It needs to be more than just coach speak. You know, like coach speak after the game where the other team gets absolutely blown out and then they have the other person like, yeah, that's a strong team, a good team. You're like, no, they weren't. No, -uh. you absolutely just destroyed them. They're actually, they're actually really bad. Do you need to actually enforce it? Don't give coach speech. We've, we've seen coach, don't give coach speech. You actually need to enforce it and believe in it. And then bring security up in every business decision because you are only as secure as your least secure partner or your least secure vendor. Because if you're going to partner with ABC Incorporated, and ABC Incorporated is going to house some of your data, and they get hacked through transitive property, you have just gotten hacked. Your customer's data has just gotten lost as well. So you need to bring security up in every business decision as you possibly can, because the bigger you get, the stronger your organization is, the more partners your organization has, the more risk you're going to take on. There's a risk with partnering with another organization for something inherently, but if you do your due diligence, you can make it through it. You can definitely make it through it. So here's that homework. Develop a checklist. Start looking at the day-to-day. -day. Start looking at acceptable use policies. What are you going to allow within your organization? Start looking at privileged user access. Who has access to the goods? Start asking yourself, like, like the old robber days, like where's the good start? Who has access to those? And make sure there's a policy in line that aligns with the governance goals, but also aligns with your business goals and creates the behavior you would like to see out of your employees. Identify your critical resources. What can you, do, what can you not do business with, without? Then develop strategies on how you're going to protect this. Next. How are you going to classify everything? Start classifying risk, categorize your information. Do not make this overly complex. Please keep it simple. Something is better than nothing. As I was going through my doctorate, my, one of my dissertation chairs, she told me, Eric, 80% solution is better than no solution. So if you can give 80%, let's give 80%, something simple. Your risk register doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can just be a few things. Make sure you outline those out. Start looking at your service providers. Just know you're least secure. You are as the most secure or as least secure as your least secure vendor. Do you have SLAs? Do they have insurance? Do they have any kind of compliance at all? Are they simply winging it? If they're not winging it, then you may not want to do, part, uh, do business with them. And do you have an NDA? Is your information going to sit there, and is it going to be just thrown out there? So what, most, what must you do? So that's the homework I'm asking you to do. But what's the least? What do you have to do? Categorize and classify systems. Classify your data. Perform an asset inf inventory and see what laws apply to your business. That's the very least you must do. 
Throw a risk register on top of that if you possibly can. And talk to SBDC if you can to see if you're doing this right. Because understand that you are the difference between data breach and success. You are 100% control here. Don't just think it's on the cyber professionals and just say, they, they got me, there is nothing I need to do. No, you are in control, you are the difference, and your decisions absolutely matter.